Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. So Michael Naka leads partner products at Ride Report, working directly with mobility providers and cities around the world on mobility management and compliance. Michael was a product manager at Movil, which was acquired by Daimler Auto Group, where he helped build a multimodal, or MOS, transportation platform for public transit agencies and cities. Michael's also one of the leading voices in the emerging mobility space, where he writes The Movements Newsletter. It's a weekly newsletter that highlights stories in the mobility industry focusing on mobility software, cities, and infrastructure and i'll also add that it's one of the only uh, few newsletters that i read each and every single week so congrats on that michael and uh, welcome to the podcast thank you harry uh that's a real honor to hear <laughs> that we're in the top newsletter selection for you i think you're in my top three and uh, that's either saying a lot for you or i'm just lazy <laughs> and don't read that much i don't know maybe a little of both <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most likely. But yeah, so no, I, I do. I do love your newsletter, and uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on is because of you know I think that you have this in depth knowledge uh, in the scooter industry. I know that's one of your passions, but also just generally, I was thinking about it that wow, every week for you know how long have you guys been doing the newsletter? We are coming up on week eighty. Wow! So very impressive. Almost- two years yeah a few months so. yeah and i mean it sort of just got me thinking that you know one of the reasons why i think that i've become so knowledgeable in the rideshare industry is just from repetition right just from reading yeah. every single article that comes out right it's because it's something that i'm like personally and passionately interested in and then of course you know i'm out there talking to people and trying these services out for myself but it's almost like sometimes i feel like i'm a bit of a historian right uber is making all these changes right now to the driver app and it's reminding me of when sidecar had all these features like six years ago. And I bet a lot of new people at, you know, in the industry or even Uber and Lyft probably don't remember that, but I do just because I, yeah. you know, was reading about it. So do you sometimes sort of feel that way too, that you're kind of like part historian or how do you think about your newsletter and all the topics <sighs> you're reading? Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, I think the genesis of the newsletter was, uh, me and my co-writer, Adam Feldman, uh, who was working for sidewalk labs at the time, a few years back, uh, we were always DMing back and forth about uh, new products, new features coming out in mm-hmm. the mobility space. And like you said, at the time, Uber and Lyft and all these new apps were coming out and they were testing all these interesting features from mapping tools to you know Uber Pool Express. Um, and I didn't really see an outlet out there kind of like highlighting these on yeah. a weekly basis. Um, and you know, most of the talk in transportation over the last five years has been directed towards the electrification of the automobile and autonomous vehicles. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, huh, there might be a small niche market to talk more about the software side, the mobility services that are emerging uh, from startups to the big players like Uber and Diddy uh, to the OEMs who are investing in this space heavily. And so I wanted to have a outlet uh, where we could talk about that. And it's been pretty dang cool over the last couple of years to build this community of, you know, product managers, business development folks, designers from all over the space, sharing information and news and kind of like looking at emerging insights from yeah. all over the world, which, which is always exciting to me because, uh, you know, what a Russian ride hailing app is doing, <laughs> uh, could be coming into the U S, uh, in, you know, in six months yeah. uh, on the, as a feature in the Uber app. So, or vice That's versa, cool. right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I, I am a big mobility nerd, and I think it shows through the <laughs> newsletter. Yeah, no, I think it's, and we'll obviously leave a link so people can subscribe in the show notes, but it's also pretty easy to find. And uh, I am curious, so, you know, sort of having done this for 80 weeks, are there any other stats you can share around the newsletter, whether it's subscribers or, I mean, have you guys missed a week? I feel like you're in my inbox almost every single week. You know, <laughs> it's been a, <laughs> it gets tough okay. some weeks, uh, but we've missed a few weeks around holidays. Uh, but yeah, we've multiple thousands of subscribers cool. and over 50% open rate weekly, wow. which is pretty good. Um, and yeah, it just slowly and steady keeps growing. Um, I feel like every time a new mobility company pops up, uh, 
we'll get a bunch of new subscribers from that startup. Yeah. Uh, oh, interesting. You know, yeah. yeah. What is the, uh, I guess your, your kind of list, what is it comprised of? Is it people in the industry? Is it employees, reporters? Uh, have you ever dug into, you know, whether either actually looking at the email subscribers, just I'm sure yeah. you talk to your subscribers all the time, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's actually very diverse audience. Uh, surprisingly, um, you know, it, it started off really heavily on the ride hailing and mapping side. Uh, so the big mapping companies and ride hailing companies, but it's, really diversified over the last year um and talking to insurance companies mm -hmm. investors um uh, non city folks planners academics uh you name it they're they're subscribed e even a few medical doctors who are just interested in micromobility mm -hmm. interesting uh, on the injury side or something like that yeah yeah very cool so uh you know i know that you do have a day job at ride report so is the newsletter something you do kind of just for fun in your spare time are you guys trying to turn it into a business or monetize it somehow or you know what, what are your thoughts there yeah um you know for adam and i we we just wanted to first create a community because uh there's about a lot of interesting thinkers in this space yeah uh, um, and it, it was just a side hustle really. Uh, and it kind of grew a little bit bigger and faster than I, I thought. Um, and you know, over the last year, something we've been trying is to host in, uh, you know, local events in person. Mm -hmm. And so we've done a few events in LA, uh, which I think you attended, uh, San Francisco and just last week in New York city. Um, oh, and very cool. Had really wide ranging audience of folks who subscribed to the newsletter and had, you know, con continued the conversation in person and, you know, uh, you know, meet people face to face. And I think that's been worth it for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, you know, I mean, we're open to taking it different directions in the future, but we really love the community aspect yeah. uh, of what we're building. And, and most recently we've been testing this, what we call debt deep, guest DJ, mm -hmm. uh, which you have industry folks step up and actually curate the newsletter uh, mm -hmm. and kind of bring in new insights. So we have folks from Uber and Jump uh, write a newsletter uh, for, for, for a week. Yeah, no, I, I really like that uh, sort of style just to get a new voice in there. I mean, even though it's the sort of same sort of style newsletter, and I know you had a Alex Vickers from uh, Jump and Uber recently uh, guest DJ. And I thought that was a good one. Actually, uh, after I read that, I invited him onto my podcast. So it even uh, worked out ah, perfect. <laughs> well for all, um, you know, when I saw his name pop up on there. So uh, very cool stuff. And, you know, I think uh, I'm, I'm, gl I'm, I'm glad I'm, I appreciate you sharing kind of that background on the newsletter. I guess on a selfish level, you know, as a fellow content creator, I think that what you guys are doing is very cool. Um, and I hope that you continue doing more of it and definitely love the personal event side. And I think you're right. The community you've built is a uh, uh, pretty awesome and definitely, uh, you know, kind of like mobility nerds, like you said. So, you know, digging into what kind of what I wanted to talk to you about today is uh, that nerdy mobility stuff, right? I mean, we're here yeah. at the beginning of 2020, and I think you're the perfect person. You know, why I really wanted to have you on is because you've been studying and you've been looking at all these different areas of mobility. So, the first question I want to ask you is kind of what excites you the most right now? I guess what category or sector of mobility excites you the most right now, kind of headed into 2020? Yeah, um, for, for me, it's it, right now it's micro mobility. Mm -hmm. uh, I think. We ended the, the 2010s uh, on a high with billions of dollars being invested in the space, um, and you know, 50 scooter companies pop out overnight. Um, but right now, we're kind of in the trough of disillusionment, mm -hmm. and people are trying to figure out the business models. But at the same time, I, I'm still really excited because it's shown this existence proof that people are willing to try new modes that are outside of the car in our in our you know dense urban environments. Um, and I think a lot of the groundwork is being laid right now with the investment in R and D uh, in micromobility on the sharing side and on the private side. We're seeing the supply chain being built out uh, in Southeast Asia and China, mm -hmm. uh, and that's really going to enable new entrepreneurs to like build new hardware. And we're already seeing that. And like I try to highlight that in the newsletter weekly. Like, look at this new contraption or pod or hoverboard thing coming out. Uh, yeah. And a lot of that's being driven because there's so much investment in this space and entrepreneurs are stepping up and trying to take a crack at building new form factors and thinking differently. And that's what excites me uh, when I get approached by 
you know, somebody in a garage in Seattle building uh, autonomous e-bike mm-hmm. or uh, some kind of pod or something I've never even thought of. And I, I think, you know, this is just the beginning of micromobility. Um, and we're going to have a fun decade ahead in terms of product development and hardware. And yeah. I think we'll see some surprises along the way. Interesting. And so when you say micromobility, I think everyone probably knows what you're talking about, but we're talking scooters, we're talking e-bites. I mean, is it, do, yeah. do you have a kind of short, quick definition of micromobility? Yeah, I, I, I generally subscribe to Horace Davies' uh, definition of uh, uh, electric powered vehicle under 500 kilograms. Uh, that's primarily used for utility, and right now we manifest that's manifested as electric bicycles, mm-hmm. scooters, uh, mopeds, and other new contraptions coming out um, on our city streets. Um, and you know, most of the hype has been around the shared space, yeah. and that's manifested itself with scooter sharing, bird lines of the world, uh, but. I think micro mobility is much more broader than just some scooters on the street and yeah. uh, we'll start seeing more and more experiments he- yeah. heading that way. Yeah, it definitely seems like Bird and Lime were kind of obviously the the catalyst to this micro mobility movement and you know, I guess it was what 2018 that was sort of the year of the scooter, right? <laughs> when they when they burst onto the scene and were raising tons of money and you're yeah. right, 2019, yeah, right. I mean, I guess Bird raised uh, almost I think 275 million or something like that at the end of um, 2019 in October, but Lime it looks like has sort of struggled to raise their next big round and kind of when I compare that to the growth I saw with Uber and Lyft days, right? Like these companies were basically always raising money, never had issues there. And there's sort of some, right, higher valuations. And so I think that it's hard to disagree with you there, but it sounds like the reason why you're excited isn't because of the birds and the limes. It's because a lot of the smaller, the newer uh, players. And and I think I tend to agree. I mean, it feels like I'm seeing, you know, definitely not the same kind of hype at the, with the big boys, but at the bottom levels, you know, like I see, I I follow um, on Twitter, I follow this uh, blog called electric which is more of a tesla blog to be frank and they're huge tesla blog but now they're like i see them all reviewing scooters and reviewing bikes and reviewing skateboards and i see the verge doing similar and actually you know all these big outlets are like reviewing you know they're they've co- always covered yeah. bird and line but now they're like reviewing all this these other new modes and all, all of that right it's beyond scooters though right yeah it's completely beyond scooters and I, <laughs> it's a funny thing you bring up I, I i get hit up all the time like what's your favorite scooter what's your favorite e-bike and yeah. i'm like uh, I don't know. And I don't have any good resources to point people to right now. Hmm. Uh, but again, we're really at these early stages and a lot of the resources and the media kind of ushering this new micro mobility age in to where we are, are just starting to form. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I'm getting really excited about, uh, empowering startups and entrepreneurs in this space and not just at scooter sharing, but like media outlets, uh, infrastructure, uh, hardware, uh, app software, uh, network layer that connects all these vehicles. It's some exciting things in the works. And sometimes we can just talk about the big players and their troubles like all the time, but there's a lot of people, smart people working in this space and more capital being invested every day. Yeah. So before we move on to another topic, I've got a, a, a question for you. I want to know if you had to start some company in the micromobility space, you know, today, uh, in the next few days or in the next few months, what would the company be? I mean, you don't need to share the exact idea or what it might be, but generally, like if you, you know, had to do something, what would you do? Like what opportunity do you see, you know, and feel free to, you know, any part of micromobility really. Yeah. Um, for me, I, I think I get really excited about the hardware, uh, okay. and I think there's a very big opportunity in the electric bike space over the next decade uh, that's relatively untapped. Um, e-bikes today have been made the same way, or like they're basically the, the bicycle with a battery and motor slapped onto them, mm-hmm. and most of the margin goes to the drivetrain manufacturers like the Bosches and Got it. Uh, yeah, Yamaha's of the world. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of a lot of room to reinvent the e-bike and, and redesign it from the ground up uh, to make it a vehicle that lasts longer, less maintenance, anti-theft, 
uh, and just mm. completely rethink it from the ground up. Um, so this would be a personally owned uh, vehicle, you're thinking, e-bike? Yeah, personally owned. And I think there's some interesting subscription models and mm-hmm. things bundled into that. Uh, but I, I'm thinking more of a software-powered electric bicycle mm. uh, where everything is software-tuned. Uh, interesting kind of i mean it sort of it sounds like you're kind of combining like the apple branding of e-bikes with like the tesla software updates of a car right mm-hmm. something kind of yeah. you know in that realm and think of it in yeah exactly I mean, being able to develop apps on top of these vehicles yeah. uh and have a whole new uh app store in in some sense uh but yeah i think that that's a space to watch for sure and uh, I would definitely start something in it, uh, one day, but cool. Yeah, no, I like that idea. And if anyone listening right now ends up, uh, doing that, uh, they can maybe send a, a small royalty to you. May, most of it can go to you and maybe some to me since yeah. I'm interviewing yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Yeah. So micro mobility. All right. So that I think definitely is going to be a big uh, theme of 2020. Is there another uh, theme? I've, I've got a list over here. So if you're not ready, you just let me know. But is there another theme that you're sort of uh, maybe not excited about necessarily, but um, something that you think is going to be big or something you're thinking about in 2020? Yeah, I, I think one theme ending the last decade is we've seen this divestment or uh, pull out from a lot of the large automakers in Mm. shared mobility services. And that's really been the German automakers pulling back out of North America, uh, our backyard uh, with the car sharing services that have been running for, you know, nearly a decade. And, uh, right. That was what car to go and Zipcar and Zipcar is still operating in the U S I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Car to go and reach now, uh, pulling out of North America completely. Um, and I, I, and then you have Get Around, which is softbank funded peer to peer car sharing uh, platform, actually doing reducing headcount and layoffs lately mm-hmm. as well. Um, but it's a little bit of a discouraging trend because I think car share is a vital part of the mobility ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, and I hope in that we can reverse that trend coming into the 2020s. Yeah. But, uh, and uh, just just so we don't confuse people, because we are on the Rideshare Guy podcast, and it is a bit of a confusing name, right? I, when I say Rideshare, <laughs> I'm usually referring to Uber and Lyft, right? And uh, <laughs> car share, though. So car share, I mean, is basically, you know, like the companies you mentioned, right? car to go and get around. It's where you're, you know, literally, you know, when you need to rent a car, you need to, you're going to go out and rent a car and share it, you know, with some mm-hmm. other people, right? Um, yeah. So I, I am curious, though, as far as car share, wh- why do you think car share is such an important important, I guess, aspect of the mobility landscape or in simpler terms, like why should I care about car share? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, if you're, if you're looking at the trends and seeing, let's say, take this concept of the automobile Mm -hmm. being unbundled and you have ride sharing and micro mobility and transit and walking, uh, I think uh, cities and our urban environments need to have strong mobility services. Uh, yeah. And car share is one of those pillars uh, that solves a specific use case for people that ride but, sharing can't do, you know, I can't take the ride share or Uber to uh, the mountains or right. go to the beach. Well, I could, but, you know, yeah, people definitely do, but it's not, uh, <laughs> it's, it's somewhat frowned upon by drivers. Yeah. Let's just put it yeah. that way. <laughs> uh, and so, I think car share solves some specific jobs people hire an automobile or like a car yeah. for. Sort of uh, like it, it, it's like those infrequent but big jobs. Like the yeah. reason why you keep yeah. the car around is for that one people. time a year. Yeah. You know, that you need a Christmas tree. <laughs> yeah. And like I, I just anecdotally talking to people in DC and Toronto mm-hmm. and Portland, like people who relied on these services are now at the auto dealers buying new cars because, you yeah. It's it, it just makes it life a little bit harder to live without a, a car, uh, and so I that's that, that's been a red flag for me, and that's something I've been tracking closely. But uh, hmm. yeah, I, I think it leaves opportunity for cities to step yeah. up uh, and and new private entities to do joint partnerships for providing a car share service for for people. Yeah. 
Do you think maybe the car share companies were just a little too early? I actually remember on one of the first blogs I started before the rideshare guy, I remember I reviewed uh, car to go when I was living in San Diego and I loved the service. Um, yeah. It was great. I think they even read my post and sent me like $50 in free credit, a nice little bribe, which um, <laughs> totally uh, was great. I was like, I love bribes. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you I know, think, I think, uh, that was a long time ago, though, yeah, right? Like these car to go and zip yeah, car no, companies launched a long time ago. I mean, why would you pay, you know, if you can get someone else to drive you around in an Uber, you know, kind of why would you um, pay to drive yourself is sort of what I've always thought in regards to car share. Yeah. But I do agree with you on kind of like how important it is to getting people to unbundle the auto. Yeah, I think they, they were early. Uh, I think one of the challenges it is was or is, is that these car share companies were actually subsidiaries of large automakers uh mm -hmm. and if you look at the automaker business they're not operations companies like they yeah. they're good at is building cars at scale uh yeah. delivering them to dealers um and financing them uh and then but when you put your own assets on the ground and mm -hmm. you're trying to generate revenue off them it's a totally different business and the, the yeah. set of competencies uh and i think it's Another challenge was with the actual vehicles themselves, like the mm. these standard automobiles and Mercedes, BMW, smart car, Mini Coopers. They're they're made for personal ownership. They're not made to yeah. take wear and tear and drive three hundred minutes uh, uh, during the day. Um, and you know, I think it's combining all these challenges together and just made it unsustainable business to yeah. run. Um, and so, yeah, I think. The OEMs have also realized that mobility services are just really difficult to run and really difficult to make money. And if Uber and Lyft stock prices are any indication, <laughs> uh, it, they're kind of retreating back and like, all right, we're going to refocus on our core competency of building vehicles rather than putting out a thousand in a city and hoping to make money off sharing them. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's looking pretty good to be a, a, a Tesla, you know, OEM type right now. Yeah. I think their market cap just hit a hundred billion dollars. Yeah. I want, I want to say, yeah. so, you know, you know, it's interesting because I do totally agree with you and I can kind of even share a personal experience, you know, kind of with the car share, um, or, you know, just sort of these OEMs, I think kind of being heavily involved in the car share space and maybe just, you know, there's some key, I guess, kind of aspects of running that business that either they didn't have the skills for, or they were sort of trying, you know, kind of didn't have the greatest product market fit. I remember um, we did a huge marketing campaign with Ford at one point where they wanted to put these Ford Fusion hybrids in front of a bunch of Uber and Lyft drivers and sort of see if they would go out and yeah. buy any. And that was sort of the gist of the campaign. But I remember when I asked them why they chose that car, they told me, oh, it's because we have a bunch coming off of lease. Right. And yeah. so it wasn't it was more like, hey, we had all these cars. <laughs> what can we do with them? Yeah. <laughs> you we, know? You know, you Versus. Them. Yeah. Right. Versus like, what's the best, you know, if they're really, you know, trying to get a foothold with Uber and Lyft drivers and, you know, right now the most popular Uber and Lyft car by far is Toyota the, and, and specifically the Prius, right? If they're trying to kind of get to that spot, you would sort of want to start from a place like what from a product market fit, like what's the best vehicle for Uber and Lyft drivers? What do they care most about the gas, you know, and sort of go down that list. But it yeah. was just funny to me. They were like, oh, we just had all these, you know, fusion hybrids. So, you know, like, let's get rid of them. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and to my early point, I think that's what made micro. I'm excited about micro mobility because, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's scooters right now, but they're spending significant R and D and investment dollars in, uh, hardware and building yeah. hardware, for sharing and for being out 24 mm. 7 365 days a year uh and not yeah. only that but for for the operations team who have to go out and charge rebalance clean these vehicles on a daily basis and i think you know they're coming from the low end and working their way up market uh i don't know yeah. if they'll do cars one day but uh, lime has experimented with that in the past uh but i think having hardware that's built purpose built for car sharing or ride sharing is is something yeah. hopefully we'll see some experiments coming on in this you know. decade that's a really interesting point. I mean, I guess it's sort of cars versus scooters and, you know, the, the cycle times are going to be a lot 
quicker. You know, the lead times are a lot quicker to build new scooters in general than a newer car. But I mean, the hardware right now, I think scooters is really the only that, it, you know, I guess scooters and e-bikes is really the only kind of industries or areas of mobility um, where the hardware is sort of being designed for sharing. I mean, yeah. even in ride hailing, right? Like I saw, I remember one of the stats I saw was that, um, the front seat of the car is a lot safer than the back seat. And it was some article we were working on about safety uh, for the rideshare guy. And I, it sort of got me thinking like, wow, every time you get into the back of an Uber, you're actually, you know, not, you're a little bit yeah. less safe yeah. um, than being in the front <laughs> seat. And it's just because, you know, now, it, and at some point, maybe car manufacturers, the OEMs will design, you know, like the perfect rideshare vehicle. But, you know, there is stuff like that. I don't know. What do you think about like kind of that hardware yeah. design? I mean, I guess rideshare, car share. Um, none, none of these, uh, none of the hardware there. Do you think it's just because it's cars and it's harder or what do you think? Yeah. I, I, Cause auto manufacturing is all about scale and you have to guarantee yeah, you can move true. tens of thousands of vehicles to, you know, set up tooling for in a supply chain for the vehicle. Uh, I think that's why a lot of OEMs have been hesitant about doing purpose built, uh, vehicles for ride sharing and, yeah. and, and car I mean, it's just sharing. not worth it for yeah, them. Uh, but I'll say that they're starting to, uh, you're starting to see VW experiment with custom, you know, m- bands for, for ride pooling or car sharing and ride sharing. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I would also, at add, the same time though, they, they've wasted a lot of money on some of these <laughs> other initiatives. I mean, I mean, let's be honest, right? I, I, like I'm a fan of it. Like we got, we need to get people trying these things and like, uh, yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, why not try hardware, yeah. like purpose built hardware for a ride share yeah. or car share? Like I've seen companies waste like hundreds of millions of dollars in other areas, you know, I mean like car to go, you know, you know, not waste, but there's definitely some interesting, uh, you know, well, I think poor choices to yeah. be blunt, you know? But, and then if we like shift to the other side of the world and look at China, China has a billion mm-hmm. people, rapidly uh developing and people are demanding cars and get ways to get around uh yeah i think there's some interesting auto manufacturers and vehicle manufacturers there who are building who have mm. you know they're starting at the low end of the market they have yeah manufacturing capabilities there in the country and they i i know diddy has said in the past they they're working on building purpose-built uh vehicles for ride sharing in the country yeah. and i think you know one place to watch is definitely the chinese market over the next five years mm. uh and seeing if that actually exports to other markets like europe and north america as well yeah that's a really good point because i think you and i were both at commotion yeah. and i don't know if you saw this vehicle there i think it was called the lily or something yeah. like that but basically what it was was a small two-seater electric car and uh, maybe it wasn't the perfect uh, rideshare vehicle but you know i could sort of imagine something that's more of like a tri setup with a driver in the front and two in the back that's small and that's electric and it sort of got me thinking like wow you know, there, I mean, I mean, I think there's a lot, and I think you're right. I think maybe the China mar- Chinese market is the one to watch for a lot of that type of hardware yeah. development because you know I haven't seen any of that in the U.S. And it, it really, you know, I was talking to a couple actually young entrepreneurs who had who were kind of pitching me on ideas <laughs> that they had in rideshare businesses, and like a couple of them, I was thinking to myself like, wow, this is actually a pretty damn good yeah. idea. <laughs> Some of the stuff that they were talking around around electric and you know these smaller shared vehicles, you know, because as, as a Uber and Lyft driver, I mean, almost every single ride is only one passenger or sometimes two passengers yeah. you know there's the friday saturday saturday nights where it's more but you know even then there, it seems like there's a lot of opportunity for that um purpose yeah. I, I like that term purpose built uh, hardware is that what we called it you called it yeah that's that's i, I don't think i coined that term who'd you, but who'd you steal that yeah, from <laughs> someone out there thank you whoever you are but all right uh, yeah watch the we'll, we'll get some market. tweets for yeah. that one okay all right. So, I mean, I guess even maybe, you know, I don't know if there's anything to expand there in the Chinese market in general in mobility. But one thing you said earlier that I really like is some of these trends, you know, I, I think traditionally, like especially with ride share sort of started in the U.S. And then one, two year, three years later went uh, global around the world. And I feel like if I'm an entrepreneur sitting in one of these other countries and just sort of like casually paying attention, you can have like a huge head start yeah. because, you know, vice versa with like micro mobility kind of started in China yeah. and then came to U.S. So it's really interesting yeah. to see how you know two you know I, I guess china and the u.s is, are very different in a lot of ways but i mean you know you can kind of really like 
get that geo arbitrage, right? Just kind of by paying attention to what's going on. Are there any other regions of uh, the globe that you sort of have an interest in? And, you know, I know that I know the world's a big place, so we don't have to go over everything, yeah. but maybe if there's one other region you had in mind or something you've been watching. I, I think one other example is uh, India, another high population mm-hmm. country. Uh, they were looking at the micromobility market uh, and obviously electric scooters aren't the best on, on the infrastructure there, but, uh, there's a company there called Bounce Share uh, yeah. and, out of Bangalore, and I just saw a stat recently from their CEO and founder that they they just cross a hundred thousand trips per day wow. with, oh, uh, wow. with mopeds. Uh, or, mm. well, like it's kind of like a beefier scooter. Um, yeah, but yeah, that, I mean that's a staggering number. Like if I if you could do that in a U.S. city, that it'd be incredible. But I, I think yeah. watching the Indian market is fascinating a lot of entrepreneurs there they have some manufacturing capabilities as well and just a large population of people to serve yeah definitely do you think that as far as the market dynamics it's important to sort of have the right kind of population on the consumer side or more important to have kind of the right entrepreneurs technology side or is it kind of a mix of both uh you know, I, I bias towards entrepreneurs and technology side of thing. I really mm. think uh, they can kind of like make it work regardless they of the market. Make it work, and then you know, uh, consumption go go to the other and markets, drives yeah. demand, and mm-hmm. you know, regulators and cities can obviously set up uh, a, a regulatory friendly environment for for people and entrepreneurs. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's like uh, consumer demand. Like the regulations change yeah. consumer demand, and that's why over the last eighteen months of like say scooter sharing or in bike sharing, you know, uh, at the state level and city level, rules have been changing to open up uh, markets for scooter sharing, and bike sharing, and cities are starting to quickly adapt to the realities of scooter sharing, uh, you know, by putting it, changing parking spots and making them um, basically docks for these electric small electric vehicles, um, and so I. I'm bullish on getting more entrepreneurs out there and enabling them into mm-hmm. in mobility. And I think one of the challenges and one of the things I'm afraid of is like having too many regulations and, and too many constraints. Mm-hmm. And because it a lot, it, it pushes a lot of people away uh, from the space where we definitely need more, more, yeah. more entrepreneurs and builders uh, thinking about it. Um, well, uh, well, Michael, I've got bad news for you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> One of one of my 2020 predictions is that uh, 2020 will be the year of regulation, <laughs> and uh, I, I tend to share a lot of your views that you, you've expressed so far. But I think, especially in the rideshare uh, oh, yeah. space, which you know we've touched on here and there, um, you know I think regulators. You know, let's we'll start with rideshare. We can maybe chat generally about regulation, but you know with rideshare specifically, uh, you know too much. You know, kind of I've said this many times, and I keep saying it. Too much of a good thing can be bad. And uh, too much Uber and Lyft, you know, eight million trips a day or whatever that, yeah. <laughs> whatever they're doing uh, a day can be bad. You know, you look out in a city like LA, there's forty, fifty thousand drivers, causing um, you know, there's just a lot, right? And so it's causing some issues. Some of them, I think, are fairly pinned on Uber, but frankly, I think they're an easy yeah. scapegoat for a lot of other issues, whether it's congestion or you know, taxes and fees. Um, labor issues and you know like some of these you know i would say even in all of these categories uber is probably having a small or you know some negative impact but at the same time uh, i think that they're really like in a lot of these cases an easy scapegoat so i think we're going to see a lot more regulation in the rideshare industry since the sort of political tides have turned there and we're sort of i mean not sort of we are already seeing that regulatory tide turn against them i'm curious to know what do you think about regulation in in general i mean how, how big or how important do you think it'll be in 2020 you touched on it with micro mobility um but maybe we can expand yeah I, i'll stay at the high level i think uh regulation is absolutely it's important and i think we need to empower cities yeah. uh <clears throat> but at the same time what I, to my earlier point it actually inhibits entrepreneurs from trying these new things like travis uh vander and you know he couldn't just apply for a scooter permit or contact the city in Santa right. Monica. He had to actually just put out 200 vehicles <laughs> and see what happened. Um, and so I, I, my, I would say my, my fear is like the big companies, the Ubers, the Lyfts, Birds mm-hmm. and Limes of the world, uh, 
we'll be able to afford the regulatory costs, you know, from permitting fees, yeah. but also lobbyists and government relations folks in all these different markets. And that that's going to hurt the smaller, you know, smaller players and new startups yeah. emerging in the space over the next decade, um, because you just you can't compete with the Waymos and Ubers of the world. Yeah, in well, terms of budget. Well, what's really yeah, what's really interesting is that there's this you know term that I think uh, all those MBAs out there listening right now probably know called regulatory capture, and uh, I remember reading about it and kind of learning about it because in a lot of these bigger industries like telecoms and air, air airlines and things like that, basically the big boys put in a ton of regulations because they want to make it harder for new, smaller, more agile startups or entrants to compete, right? And what's been interesting for me is that in the ride share industry, especially, it was kind of the opposite. Uber and Lyft didn't want <laughs> as any yeah. regulations as they got bigger. And now there's a lot more regulation sort of happening. And even though they don't want it, it's still kind of benefiting them because of that regular yeah. regulatory capture. And, you know, one thing that I, I feel like I, I totally agree with you on everything so far that you've said about regulations, but one area that I think would be valuable to cities that they're not really getting right now is the data. And actually, I guess this ties into your day job too at Ride Report, but the more people, you know, I've been interviewing a lot of people kind of involved in the policy side and uh, the public transportation and all that on my podcast lately, but it does seem like, you know, the more like data won't inhibit a lot of the good aspects of, you know, like the entrepreneurial spirit and everything, you know, all of the good of these young entrepreneurs isn't really inhibited by providing data to all of these cities. And so I'm curious to know, um, you know, I know that's a whole yeah. other topic, but that's like kind of one area where I feel like I think cities and, you know, regulators that that's kind of seems like a good starting point to me to like make demands. There. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think in my shared micromobility over the last 12 months, 18 months, we've seen that pl start to play out uh, with the formation yeah. of the mobility data specification, which was actually designed for autonomous yep. vehicles uh, and then repurposed mm. for scooter sharing, bike sharing operators. Um, and, you know, it's been really cool to see all these operators actually, they are sharing data with the cities uh, where vehicles are, mm -hmm. where, where, where trips are yeah. occurring. Um, and I think that that is awesome. And like, Data sharing is great um, from a compliance and regulatory side and planning side. Uh, but, you know, like uh, I, I think the industry and people in our echo chamber and in cities think if we have more data, like things will change, like like <laughs> uh, magically we'll yeah. have 500, you know, new bike lanes or uh, curbside drop off right. zones for Uber and DoorDash. But at the end of the day, like, we can have all the data. We, we need more political capital and political will to make the changes uh, uh, mm -hmm. that we're wanting to see in, in this space, whether that's, uh, you know, congestion pricing or uh, reduced parking or new bike lane infrastructure, investment in public transit and other uh, services. It, it's a political will and uh, question. Uh, and yeah. we can provide all the data we want, but <laughs> it's... Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I agree there. I mean, actually, my, my former career as an aerospace engineer, I used to work with large data sets and Excel spreadsheets, you know, like tens of thousands of rows. And I can only imagine, you know, like that was pretty tough yeah. stuff. You know, I can only imagine you throw a million scooter data points to some, um, you know, not that city officials couldn't handle it, but it's just tough. Yeah. It's hard work. Um, so. And, uh, you know, so I guess I'm also thinking of it more as like, let's throw these guys a yeah. bone. <laughs> let's, you know, if, if they, if they're going to regulate something, let's regulate the data piece of it. Like don't be regulating where, you know, one company can be like, you know, in San Francisco, get a permit and, you know, they're like scoring top marks and then another city where they're operating the exact same and doing all the same things. They don't even get a permit. You know, it's sort of like, I don't like, I'm, <laughs> I've never been a fan of regulate, you know, like I, I think you can't really regulate away away demand, right? If consumers want to ride scooters, they're going to do it. If they want to drink alcohol, they're going to do it. If they want to do drugs, they're going to do it. Um, I, I guess maybe we, we want we'll, we'll, we might have to stop this uh, part of the conversation. We're almost like getting political on this podcast, but I think uh, we, we we do want a lot of the same stuff for regulation. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in uh, 2020 there. Let's chat food delivery to put a nice uh, cap on this podcast since it is getting close to dinner time yeah. for both you and I. Uh, what are your thoughts about food delivery in 2020? Oh, man. It's just, 
a question on my mind for a while, but, uh, you know, (laughs) first of all, I mean, do you like, do you use food delivery services? Are you a fan just like from a consumer point of view? Yeah. Reluctantly. Yes. I think (laughs) it's, Mm -hmm. I think yeah, a lot of yeah. people say that yeah. reluctantly. No. Yes, or like, yeah, I'm kind of lazy, I, I so love yeah. Being able to, you know, order a, a meal from my favorite restaurant and have it delivered in 30 minutes, and mm-hmm. I think that, that's magical. Uh, yeah. yeah, when it works. You know, <laughs> but like right now, we have four or five different food delivery services in every market. Uh, with SoftBank, I feel like funding mm-hmm. half of them. Um, it, you know, most recently uh, with the GoPuff uh, investment they did out of Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, but you know, food, food delivery is really interesting because, uh, you have, I think there's the question, can it be a standalone business like DoorDash, um, or is it make more mm-hmm. sense as part of the, you know, the mobility ecosystem, say Uber with the Uber eats or, you know, grab yeah. food and grab rides in, in Southeast Asia. Um, I think that that's an interesting question to, to see what, what, what's going to happen there. I mean, I guess the the sort of different models are kind of like you said, right? There's a standalone food yeah. delivery companies, the the Postmates, DoorDash, Grubhub. I'm not, well, <laughs> we'll get into it, but I guess there's that category. <laughs> and then there's also the ones that are basically like Uber Eats, same thing, but I guess built into some other larger mobility stack. Um, I mean, I guess is there, you know, and where, where do you think the cloud kitchens fit into that? Do they Are they sort of just a, a piece of that, like a DoorDash? Yeah, or? yeah I think uh, cloud kitchens... Uh, yeah, I think they their own, their category? own category, but like they have the uh, chance to actually aggregate a lot of the food delivery services, uh, just mm-hmm. based on you know owning valuable real estate and having the actual su- controlling supply in cities. Um, but yeah. you know, I, I one thing I I I don't know if you saw this, Harry, but uh, you saw the Chase Sapphire uh, bundle deal with DoorDash, I believe, and. Hi. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm, and we've got a great tip for our audience right now. I mean, this, this is a great deal. First of all, the Chase Sapphire Reserve is a pretty solid credit card. Let's go completely off topic right now. This is a great credit card. You get the, the annual travel credit. I've got one for me and my wife. Uh, don't have a referral code, unfortunately, <laughs> people. But if I did, you know that I would put it in the show notes. But yeah, I mean, what was the, they just announced this partnership with yeah. DoorDash and Lyft, which I think are both and, and amazing. I, I was like, huh, it's kind of just bundling ride hailing and eats or food delivery in one service similar to uber uh mm-hmm. i don't know if it's foreshadowing anything or it's just pure coincidence but uh i i think well i mean that what, what's the actual I deal you do you get, know for doordash you get like a free year of dash pass which basically gives you like free delivery yeah, at a bunch of restaurants the lift tank. and then uh, on lyft it gives you a, a ride pass, which is a bunch of benefits. One, the main one being fifteen percent off rides, and then ten x points, ten uh, x on your points. So it's kind of like fifteen percent off. Plus, if you value the points at like two cents a point, which you know if you use for travel is a pretty good deal. It's like thirty five percent off every Lyft ride. Like I, I just tweeted something out the other day. Like I'm literally never yes. going to take Uber again. <laughs> I'm getting thirty five percent off every Lyft yeah. ride. Yeah, I, food delivery. Like, and then the other interesting point going into 2020 is Travis Kalanick pulling out of Uber off the board mm-hmm. and all his stock and doubling okay. down on Cloud Kitchens and uh, his new business there. Yeah. Um, and then rapidly expanding across, uh, um, you know, North America and China and Europe now. Uh, and that's got me thinking a lot about how, what's, what's the future of, restaurants and how does food delivery play in that in that role yeah. um do you have any thoughts there Harry? yeah i mean i'm curious to know i mean we can chat consolidation because i guess the the real question is for me is that you know i think when you look out to uber and Lyft, okay these companies have never made a profit but i think in certain businesses or certain industries like profitability isn't as important as it used to be if you can sort of um, tell a growth story, right? If you have some bigger, bolder yeah. opportunities on the board, whether they're one, five, or ten years away. Whereas with food delivery, yeah. it's just food delivery. <laughs> you yeah. know, like what sexy story? Well, I mean, what sexy story are you going to tell there? I mean, Postmates, you know, they're now advertising movies every time you place an order. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, maybe make a little ad revenue, but I don't know if you've seen that. But yeah. um, good tip for yeah. your newsletter. And uh, you know, so for me, I feel like. 
at a certain point, you know, like I'm pulling, I pulled up Grubhub's uh, stock price right now. Over the past year, they started at $77 a share and they're now at $57 a share and they've sort of been in the news a lot. And I think at the same time, the market has gone way up uh, overall during that time. So Grubhub not doing too well and they're the only public company. And I think just a lot of, I'm just, very bearish in general, like on all of these sort of normal food delivery companies like Grubhub, Postmates, DoorDash. I love them. I use them all the time. I'm lazy. I have a kid and it's also sort of my job to test out all these apps. So I don't know if anyone has placed more orders than me across all the different services. So I I don't want them to go away, but like I I just, I see how they work from the inside and uh, I, I don't, think they're very good businesses and you know I don't I don't know that I'd be qualified or confident enough to short the stocks or anything like that but yeah. I just think that we're going to see a lot of uh, these delivery companies are going to fall a lot quick a lot uh, faster than you know like ride yeah. share or some of these you, other industries you, from in the opinion. from the user side do you see any differentiation between them or is it pretty much complete? I mean the thing is you know, I, I mean, they all have different ways of <laughs> yeah. calculating the fees and, you know, calculating this and that. And, you know, but when one tries a dash pass, then the other tries a dash pass. Now, Instacart, DoorDash, Postmates all have this unlimited plan. And, you know, Postmates will go out and test this thing. They're testing another thing right now where you can kind of guarantee that your order gets there in 20 to 30 minutes for an extra $2. Okay, cool. You know, DoorDash, if that works, they're all going to copy that, right? So I just, uh, I, I think that there's room, there's going to be room for food delivery players. Uh, I just, don't know that uh, I am fairly confident that there aren't going to be four huge ones. And I don't, I don't know which business model work best. We, we have a, a really interesting interview coming up with a, uh, the CEO of a company called Cluster Truck that is doing a, sort of a full stack delivery, kind of like everything from cooking the food to, um, you know, kind of like getting the app in people's hands and uh, using their own delivery people. So that, that'll be a, yeah. a good uh, episode to listen to if anyone's interested in the food delivery space. So cool. Well, uh, I think that's a pretty good recap. I mean, we probably could chat for hours. This might, uh, I will definitely have you back on. I would say at a minimum, yeah, we might have to do yeah. this yearly, huh? <laughs> oh, there's so much to talk about. So much. <sighs> Very cool. Well, uh, if people want to learn a little bit more about uh, what you're up to, we'll leave a link to movements in the newsletter. But what's a good place? Where, where should they follow you? Where can they subscribe to movements yeah, and so, see everything that you're uh, up to? The newsletter subscription is uh, movements.substack.com. Uh, and you mm-hmm. can reach out to me uh, on Twitter uh, at Michael Naka, uh, M-I-C-H-A-L-N-A-K-A. Awesome. Well, really appreciate you coming on and uh, all the best.